Markus, kannst du deinen Screenshare wieder anmachen? Ist an. Ähm, ist also klar. I welcome Markus Stöckbauer. He's a network engineer working since over 15 years in the industry, starting at Mandar, later at EKX Megaport, and now he, is, uh, he helps designing the active site of the FTTH network for Vattenfall Eurofiber. His talk will give us an overview of passive uh, optical networks and designs and compared with active optical networks. It will show advantages and disadvantages of both technologies and give examples where one might choose over one over the other technology. If you have any questions, please use the question function on the right side. We will have a short Q&A afterwards. So Markus, please begin. Yeah, thank you very much. My name is Markus. And uh, before we start, a couple of words for introduction. My affiliation was already mentioned. I'm working for Vattenfall Eurofiber. So we are building a FTTH network in Berlin right now. So my views are that of a fiber carrier when I'm talking about FTTH networks, POM and AON. But um, although those are the views that I gained while I was working here in this field, everything I'm expressing here, all views and opinions are mine. So I don't really present um, any, uh, not my affiliation, not any other company. I'm just basically telling the, the, uh, my, my views and opinions like I see them and like, like I, I, I mean them. The presentation that you see here exists also as a series of articles. Maybe you don't want to move over there right now. The URL is here. Please note there is a no R in the URL. And, uh, but this is maybe interesting for later. There is a little bit more information on there. It's not completely done yet. There are one or two sections missing but the main technical aspects are already there. And uh, yeah, you can, you can read a little bit up on it uh, at a later point. The actual reason why I'm doing this talk is that I've seen in the last couple of months and um, yeah, the, the discussions going on in the DNOC IRC channel um, on mailing lists and so on about um, access networks, fiber build outs. And obviously as network engineers, we have opinions on that and uh, quite strong opinions. But also um, in, in those discussions and in the conversations, I noticed that um, all, all everything was, was basically based on the technology that we know from our, our field of work. So if you're working as a, in a service, uh, as a service provider on a data center network, um, you know um, networks from this aspect. And that was the same for me. I, I knew service provider networks. I knew transport networks where you uh, just push layer two over, um, over the networks. Um, I didn't know access networks that much, and I went through a learning process in the last year since I started with Vattenfall Eurofiber. And uh, this is uh, uh, this opportunity I wanted to take and give you some insights and explain access networks in the language of a service provider engineer. So in short, I'm not talking about like what wavelengths are, how optics work, uh, how fibers work or something like that. This is all something that we know and uh, that, that I'm taking for granted that we know that. I'm just uh, pointing out the differences between the networks and different scaling um, metrics that, uh, that we encounter in access networks that we don't usually have in service provider or data center networks. Another assumption or one of the main assumptions that I'm uh, doing here, uh, I'm making here is that I'm looking at a two tier network. Um, I'm talking about a fiber carrier network. Uh, the, the domain of the fiber carrier is this of uh, the access network where the subscribers are connected and the transport network. And then we have um, wholesale carriers, I call them. They can be service providers, whatever. Um, usually they are the large uh, ones that, we're talking, that we know, one-on-one, -on -one, Telefonica, Deutsche Telekom, Vodafone, who provide then the end-to-end -end service over the network of the fiber carrier. Keep this in mind when I'm talking about things because th this, is, uh, this is the base of uh, basically uh, most of the things that I'm talking here about. And, um, it's it's not you do, you don't see this um, all the time in the, in the field usually or, or sometimes the wholesale carrier is also building out fiber to the building and then obviously they don't have much incentive to resale their fiber or they just do it to an um, increased price if you have a fiber carrier who doesn't participate in the um, subscriber market who's not acting as a wholesale carrier as well they can offer a more neutral approach um, to the access to the subscribers and then um, the, the competition is happening on the wholesale carrier market because they can reach most of uh, all the subscribers of the fiber carrier for the same price usually. So 
um, I'm, I'm concentrating on that model when we're talking about uh, all the, all the, net, net, the networks here um, in this talk. Before we dive into this, um, a couple of uh, just some some short uh, definitions. Um, I'm coming in confusing definitions because Aon actually means active optical network, but there is no uh, no active com component in there as, as such. What we mean here is a point-to-point -point structure of fibers. Um, another uh, term for what would be P2P, which is point-to-point. -point. This is a synonym for Aon. And that means that each subscriber has their own fiber uh, to the first active network element. Um, there's no sharing going on. Contrast to that is PON, uh, passive optical network, where we have splitters introduced and we have a passive aggregation layer with the use of those optical splitters. So multiple subscribers share one fiber here. The advantages and disadvantages of that we'll discuss later. And just a, a real quick overview, what we want to talk about or what I want to talk about here. You're mostly listening, I'm assuming. Um, I'm talking about uh, the Aon design and topology, then jump on uh, to the PON, the passive side of PON, the, uh, the distinction that are happening there from the Aon network that we're looking at, talking a little bit about um, active network devices and protocols on the PON side, the adjustments that we make to the overall PON network design for reselling. And in the end, I just summarize and discuss a little bit the advantages and disadvantages of those technologies. This is just something I want to touch really quick on. There are a couple of acronyms that we are using here uh, or that I'm using here in those slides. Most of them are coming uh, from uh, probably the world of Deutsche Telekom or even Bundespost before. So they are German acronyms. Um, you can just, uh, uh, if you're looking up the slides later, you can just jump in here and uh, read them up. I'm just going to explain them a little bit while we are looking at the diagrams. That's a bit lot nicer than just reading through uh, all those things. Just, just as a word, um, we have here um, the German and the English word in it. Um, the, the English word is just meant as a rough translation. We are we're starting with the Aon topology. So in, in the very beginning, we have uh, I'm just, we're just looking at one building. We have a subscriber in this building at the very top here. Oh, my mouse pointer is gone. Or anyways, um, at the very top here, we have a, we have a subscriber. They have usually a, a kind of CPE kind of device, like like a Fritz box or something similar. And uh, then their fiber um, described here is number one, going from the apartment of the subscriber to the basement to a distribution box, which is called GFGV. Glasfaser Gebäudeverteiler in German. It's basically just distribution box in the basement, which holds all the um, all the fibers coming from the building, and uh, they are they are going to be terminated there. The going uh, from this termination box, we put in a, a second fiber, which goes uh, to to a, to another uh, termination box, which is called GFAP. This is in German Glasfaser Anschlusspunkt. Um, basically, it's still an, uh, another termination box in the basement. You can combine combine this with the GFGV. The main main distinction here is this termination box holds the fiber which is going to the outside of the street and marks the beginning of the domain uh, of the fiber carrier. The other box might still be in possession um, of the building owners, and they could potentially pull fibers into their apartments. So you have uh, yeah, neat and clean distinctions between those two. You usually put in two distribution boxes uh, in the basement, put a fiber in between, patch between those, and uh, and then you, you uh, continue in the domain of the, of the fiber carrier. From this uh, distribution box, the GFAP on the left side, we're going with a fiber that's number three here to a street cabinet, which uh, we will call here, here NVT, Netzwerkverteiler. And um, this uh, this is usually a small distribution box or uh, like a street cab a small street cabinet that we're putting uh, on the street and those are collecting fibers going to all the other buildings in the neighborhood. The definition of neighborhood is a little bit uh, up to the network design here. It depends a little bit how much fibers you want to terminate how much uh, fibers you can terminate in such a, a street cabinet and uh, yeah, how, how much you can handle in, uh, in, in those spaces. So you would usually put a few of those in, in a larger area that you build out with uh, fiber to the home. 
On the other side, this is the fiber number four that we're seeing here in this picture. You have a fiber uh, which goes um, to a point which we call central office. Central office is the first um, aggregation point where we put active network equipment in. This term um, has been established, I think, mostly in the PON world. Um, there, um, there might be other terms for that um, in, the, in the world of Deutsche Telekom. But uh, what, what we're using here is the CO central office thing. Potentially, you could, you could go from the first street cabinet to another aggregation street cabinet and then on to, onwards to the central office. This, this is mostly depending on the network design um, that, that, you want to, that you want to achieve. And but the important thing is that um, in this distribution box, uh, or uh, like in the, in, the, in the central office, this is the first one where we have active networks and the passive network actually stops. Um, two more um, phrases or two, two more definitions that I want to uh, give you here is um, the ones of drop cables and feeder cables. The distinction is basically drop cables are going from usually the first the street cabinet towards the houses to the buildings. Those are usually smaller cables uh, which are going there, while feeder cables go from the street cabinet towards the central office, and they are usually um, larger cables which hold a lot more fibers, where you then aggregate multiple buildings on and uh, route them further um, to the central office. This was, just really quick, um, the Aeon topology that you do. You, as you see, we're, we're mostly talking about um, just fibers, um, here, except for the couple of devices and, and the central office. But um, the, the main thing to, to, to remember is this topology is, is, is the base top topology that you use. You use this for, for a PON network as well. So we are, what we're doing now is we're diving a little bit into the PON network, the passive network design. And uh, you will see that we, we are building upon the Aeon topology that we're using here. Again, I was, I was telling you that before, uh, PON means passive opti optical network. The term here is misleading since the Aeon design we've seen before, it was also completely passive. The main thing that PON brings in here is a passive distribution layer uh, with power splitters. So uh, the ratio, split ratio is a one to a power of two. So we have like, we can one to two, one to four, one to eight, and, and so on splitters. And with, uh, with the help of those splitters, we're sharing one fiber with, between multiple subscribers. Um, one of those, uh, or each splitter adds uh, roughly 3 dB loss. So if you have a one to four splitter, um, each, each of those elements uh, gets a lot less uh, light than, than we would have before. But on, on the other hand, you can combine, combine them on one fiber. So you're basically trading a rich, uh, the, the, the length that you can use this fiber for, uh, for um, like sharing a fiber and you need to put less fibers in the ground in the end. Just real quick, the power splitter works exactly like that. You have uh, four um, end customer devices. Those are the ONTs at the top. You have the splitter in the middle and it, uh, it's a power splitter and it combines all those uh, towards the OLT. In the other direction, of course, the light is being sent out from which comes from the OLT side to all ONTs. This is the, the shared medium that we're talking about here. Where would we use those splitters now? We can put them basically everywhere um, in the fiber path, but the, the three most uh, common um, locations for those splitters is uh, first in the GFAP. In, uh, on the other side, it doesn't make much sense in the, GF, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the distribution box, which holds all the cables coming from the building because yeah, fiber in, inside the building is not super expensive. You usually just put them down there and then you, um, you're, you're done. You don't need to touch the building anymore. So the first place where you actually want to save fibers and want to combine multiple subscribers onto fiber would be the GFAP, which holds the first fiber, uh, which goes to, to the outside. And this is the first part of the domain of the fiber carrier. This is the number one here. So there could be a splitter in it. You could put a, slip, a splitter in the NVT on the street level uh, in the street cabinet. That's number two here. On this uh, splitter, you probably would combine uh, basically the building that we've just seen. Maybe other uh, we'll put other buildings on there. You can also uh, decide to route buildings past the splitter and put them directly on the fiber, uh, which go, then goes to the central office. Or you can um, you can just combine um, everything on the splitter, route them further to the central office. And that's number three. And then you can potentially put a splitter in the central office as well. 
it's um, it's all depending again on how you want to actually want to design the network. It's yeah, it, it's match and uh, match and mix. Um, you you can put them wherever you like, but you need to make sure obviously that the physics match and uh, that you you stay within the attenuation uh, and and the power um, uh, the power values that those optics are giving you. The impacts of the splitting, however, are quite large. So in this case, we're looking at a, um, a building which has 12 um, apartments. Each of those apartments has one fiber going into there. So as you see, I am in those uh, small circles. You see now the number of fibers that we're using on each, uh, on, on each, ca on each cable. So coming from those apartments, um, we, we have four different uh, with different fibers, um, which are then being terminated in, in the distribution box in the basement. So a total of 12 fibers are used here, and we're routing all those 12 fibers over to the next distribution box, the blue one on the left side, which is the GFAP, where we will combine those fibers um, with a splitter. So all those 12 fibers are going on the 1 to 16 splitter and then being routed out on one fiber. This is again, so we're basically saving 11 fibers coming from the building and uh, going to the outside. In the, um, in the street cabinet, the NVT that we're seeing here, we have again a splitter where we're combining two fibers from another cable which are coming in together with the one fiber that we're having from the current building that which I was just looking in, combining this into one fiber, routing this further uh, to the central office. And then it all those, um, yeah, all, all those apartments that we see in the building, everything that comes from the other two fibers on the left side in, in the NVT are being con combined on the one fiber and terminated on one port um, on the network devices that we have in the central office. So you see, we have a lot less fibers uh, to handle. Uh, we, we can reduce the number of fibers needed in the feeder and in the drop cables if we are introducing splitters. Um, and yeah, in general, we can we have to handle a lot less fibers, a lot less patches in between, and in res in return, we also have uh, less money to spend uh, for for a fiber build out here. Um, the downside, obviously, is that we um, that we're adding a sh shared medium for the access subscriber here. There are a couple of more downsides. We'll come to that later. Um, the benefits, um, if we actually want to use splitters, if we actually want to use PON or Aon technologies depend actually where you want to deploy that. Imagine you have a smaller city in a, like a more rural area. Um, you, might be, uh, you might find um, a lot of, uh, enough space to, term, uh, to put in a building where you want to terminate those fibers. Maybe uh, the distance between this uh, termination site and all the houses is not so large. Then you could potentially uh, pull fibers through the city into, into this one building and um, just make sure um, that everything's terminated there, Aeon deployment, everything's peachy. We, it looks a little bit different if you go into large cities. Um, as, I, as I'm saying, the company that I'm working for, Vattenfall Eurofiber, is doing FTTH deployment in Berlin, and I have uh, the experience in the last year from that. And just, uh, just uh, so we, you hear some numbers. We are um, calculating with roughly 12 apartments per building in central Berlin. Even the small street here has easily 40 buildings if you count both sides of the street. So if you would count all those apartments, we already have 480, 480 fibers if we would do an Aeon deployment here. Though this is just a small street in Berlin and just one street. And imagine how much more comes together if we're doing the whole, the whole area huge amounts of fibers that you need to route through or you need to terminate at some point. And the more fibers you have, the earlier you need to terminate. And that means the more aggregation points for uh, where you need to put active equipment you also have. This is all, um, and this is all part of, of the network design and of the, the thought that you put into that, where you need to decide which which, which technology do I want to use? What is easier to handle? What is, what is actually manageable right now? As a summary for the impact of splitters, the fiber becomes a shared medium. That's, um, that's one of the downsides. On the other hand, the passive network becomes cheaper to build, easier to scale, easier to handle, easier to operate. 
um, and it also becomes more complex and more error prone because you're adding uh, multiple stations to one fiber strand. So if one of those stations doesn't behave, you need to figure out which one that is. You need to remove it. You're adding oversubscription to the last mile, obviously. Um, last mile, I mean, between the subscriber um, and, and the active network. And um, yeah, to basically to balance the number of subscribers per fiber and the port, that's the split ratio that you want to use. This, this is the really hard part if you build those networks. On the, um, that was in, um, everything I have on the um, passive side. Now we're jumping a little bit um, onto the active devices. I'm staying fairly high level here, as you noticed already, because there's a lot of ground to cover. And I just want to give you like a high level overview and some incentives why um, carriers might use one technology over the other. Um, the main components that we have uh, for, uh, for PON networks are OLTs and ONTs. OLT means optical line terminal. It's like a switch-like aggregation device, which is in the, located in the central office. It's a, it's a, it's a larger one. It terminates uh, PON ports and has an uplink to the transport network usually. And it holds, um, it's basically the first active network device that the subscriber sees after their CPE. And the CPE on their side is then usually called an ONT, that's the optical uh, network terminal. Um, it can be a, a pure media converter from PON to Ethernet. Um, it can also be um, the, like Fritzbox uh, ex um, exists where, the, where they have the PON optic in, included. So the, the ONT part is part of the, of the Fritzbox. Then you have a whole router uh, built uh, around it. Or from other, uh, other vendors, you also get like a router-based uh, systems, which include the PON part, where you have the sm switch in it, where you have Wi-Fi in it, things like that. But in, in general, we call those um, ONTs. If we're looking at the technologies themselves, um, there are two main technologies actually um, that are in use in the field right now. That's GPON and XGSPON. Um, a, a short uh, comparison of those are on, uh, on the table on the right side. They are using different wavelengths, as you see, for downstream and upstream within the technology and between the technologies as well. So XGSPON and GPON don't use overlapping uh, wavelengths, which is good because that basically means we can use them simu simultaneously on the same fiber. There's an upgrade path for one to the other. If, if you wouldn't have the upgrade path, you would need to upgrade everyone on the same fiber strand from one technology to the other. This way on one fiber strand or on one fiber, you can have subscribers which are still on GPON and some subscribers which are already on XGSPON they wouldn't um, interfere with each other. The, um, the speed of those, oh yeah, or I, I also need to mention, there are bidio optics. So we have one fiber, obviously, uh, and um, that's why the different wavelengths for uh, downstream and upstream. The uh, maximum line rate that we're looking here for GPON, G stands for gigab uh, gigabit usually. Um, it's, uh, of course, it's a bit more than gigabit, but we have like 2.5 gigabit per second for the downstream direction and 1.25 uh, gigabit per second for the upstream direction. So this is asymmetric. The other thing for, for XGS PON is the S stands for symmetric. So we have symmetric line rates here, uh, maximum achievable on those ports for at roughly 10 gigabits per second. It's not, not exactly 10 gigabits per second, um, probably because of some overhead of the protocols that are using here. I'm not going into details of that at all. Um, but uh, it's different from Ethernet. Let's just put it like that. Um, it's, it's a different protocol in the end. It's ITU. Um, but um, it, it, it can achieve um, almost 10 gigabits symmetrical um, on, on the fiber, which is, a, which is a good thing. So, and most of the networks either run GPON and um, are in the, in the process of upgrading to some XG or XGS PON variant, in, at least in, in the midterm. Or uh, they are they are running XGS PON already because by the, right now we are at the point where XGS PON and GPON are roughly equivalent in in, uh, in pricing. Um, XGS PON is a little bit more expensive still, but uh, the benefits that you gain from it are a lot larger. So if you would start with a new network, you would probably go to XGS PON, or if you're still on GPON, you probably would upgrade in the next two to three years. The next iteration of those protocols. Um, it's not really clear yet what it will be. There's a 25G PON and a 50G PON. 
they are mostly in planning and field trials. The mass deployment of those is still a few years out before we actually see them in the field. But again, those will run on different uh, wavelengths than at least XGS PON will be. So you have an upright path from XGS PON to the next technology. Um, they are at least looking at that and that you can run them in parallel and don't need to migrate all the customers at once, which would be a really, really large pain. As I mentioned, we don't have much time for a deep dive into the transmission and control protocols. Just know they are different from Ethernet. Here are just a couple of key facts that uh, I want to give you about those protocols. We have um, OLTs and ONTs, which communicate with each other via a control protocol, which is called OMCI. And uh, there is a dedicated control channel for each ONT. So each OLT can communicate, oh, an OLT can communicate with each ONT on a, on a different channel. Um, they are negotiating some kind of encryption between the OLT and the ONT because the fiber between those two is a shared medium. So with encryption, other stations can't easily sniff. Um, I haven't looked into it actually how well the encryption is. I think it's AES something. So I think it's, it's fairly okay. With some effort, you might be able to crack it, but it's not easily doable at least. And since we have a shared medium, we also need media access control because otherwise we will have collisions, obviously. In the downstream direction from the OLT to the ONT, that's fairly easy. The OLT just broadcasts traffic out the port. Um, it's encrypted for the ONT that it's destined for. And uh, this specific ONT decrypts it. Everything is fine. In the other direction, it's a little bit more difficult um, because um, yeah, the, the ONTs need to send, they can't send at the same time, obviously. So we are using time division multiple access here, and each ONT gets a pre-assigned time slot when it's allowed to send. The time slot uh, allocation here is dynamic, which is the important part. So th they don't get all the same time slots. It depends on the distance between the OLT and the ONT, because obviously ONTs which are farther away need longer to transmit the same amount of data than OLT ONTs which are just very close to the OLT. And it also depends on the um, on the traffic that the ON, the ONT wants uh, yeah, wants to send. Usually, you don't have all subscribers on the same fiber who want to send all traffic all the time, but you have a few stations who want to send. They can signal that, and they get more they get more um, bandwidth. And then, when more uh, stations want to send, the bandwidth gets distributed over all those stations. But in general, it's being distributed in the downstream and in the upstream direction. If we're just looking at the bandwidth that we have available per user, obviously for GPON, um, if, you, if you're looking at the split ratio from 1 to uh, one to 32 usually, which is quite low usually, would, you would probably go higher um, in GPON networks. Um, then you have 77 megabits per second in the downstream and uh, 38 megabits per second in the upstream direction. That's just the maximum line rate divided by 32, obviously, um, which would mean do you achieve that if all every station wants to send and receive traffic or at full speed at the same time. If we're doing the same uh, calculation for XGS PON with a higher split ratio, 1 to 64, you already have 155, 155 megabits per second roughly in upstream and downstream direction. And again, remember the, uh, the bandwidth assignment here is dynamic. So you usually get a lot more than this, if not all the 64 stations on the same cable um, want on the same fiber want to send or receive at the same time. So, I mean, the, the, the bandwidth that you can achieve with PON is fairly decent compared to the benefit um, uh, or combined with the benefits that you have that you use less fibers. It's, it's an attractive technology that you can use um, in the field. The only problem that you have here is you can't easily break out one subscriber on a fiber and hand them over to a specific wholesale carrier. Um, so what you can do with an Aon, Aon network, each subscriber has their own fiber. And if you want uh, one subscriber wants to have one-on-one, -on -one, the other one wants to have Versatel, the, the next one wants to have Deutsche Telekom, you, you, you just hand over those fibers, you patch them, um, towards the carrier, they take over, everything is fine. That's not doable with PON because they are on a shared medium. And the solution um, that, we, that was, we're using here 
was introduced um, with the DSL uh, in DSL times already, and it's called Layer 2 Bitstream Access. So we're basically transporting Layer 2 data from, subs from the subscriber to the wholesale carrier. As a yeah, high-level network uh, diagram, it looks roughly like that. We have the transport network in the middle, number one. We have um, connected to this transport network wholesale carriers. They, they can be different ones. They can be the same ones on multiple ports, however they want to do it. The OLTs are also connected to the transport network. And the subscriber, that's number three, obviously is then uh, connected to the OLT. And if a subscriber wants to send some traffic, they will send it. Um, um, it goes to the OLT. The OLT sends it um, to the first device in the transport network. And then it gets en encapsulated in the transport protocol, whatever that is. Ethernet VPN MPLS um, or pseudo-wire based MPLS or whatever you want to use there, then then sends to the whole wholesale carrier as a layer two stream, and the wholesale carrier adds IP to the to the whole mixture, and this way you're doing the reselling model um, on PON networks. Now we're almost done. Uh, a short comparison of what we've seen, of uh, of the advantages and disadvantages. Again, this is from the point of view, um, or what I'm, the advantages that I'm going here are from the point of view of the wholesale carrier, because he's the one who holds the um, uh, the relationship with the uh, subscribers, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm so this is this is the, the most visible part for the subscribers. On the Aon side, the wholesale carrier has maximum flexibility. He has a fiber that he can light uh, that they can light themselves. They can control the access medium. And they can do whatever they like with it. On the downside, you need more aggregation points because you can't um, span um, a lot of fibers or you can't route a lot of fibers through the city like that. So the, econom uh, the economic threshold that you have here is a lot higher. What I mean by that is the number of subscribers at an um, active aggregation point that you, you as a wholesale carrier need to make it economically reasonable to build the active network equipment for this area where uh, the uh, the aggregation point is located and it, it gets split more like you have more aggregation points so that means um, you need to look at each aggregation point which serves a smaller number of uh, subscribers and you need to make sure that you have um, a minimum number of subscribers there to make it yeah, feasible for you to, to build there and get your money worth out of it. And um, an another point that I didn't mention so uh, that much so far, um, if, you're, if you want to uh, put a transition technology uh, like G dot fast mini D slams in the basement of each building, connect them with fiber back to your network. This, um, there's no resale model for that um, or no, uh, for in the Aeon world, obviously, because you have the G dot uh, fast modem or G dot fast um, D slam in, in the basement. And each wholesale carrier would need to put the, um, this one in the basement if the building administration wouldn't allow you to put fiber into the uh, apartments um, of the subscribers. So the Aeon model is cool. You get a lot of flexibility. You can get all the speed that you want. It's 100% future proof. But uh, the possibility, uh, benef the, po the possible benefits here are more on larger or established wholesale carriers. They can make, they can afford to go into those aggregation points. They can also afford to maybe wait a year or two until um, they have the, uh, the economic uh, benefits uh, from building out this aggregation point. Smaller ones, maybe not, the, not so much. On the pond side, we have um, a lot less, uh, fewer sites where you hand over um, the, the subscribers to the wholesale carriers, fewer aggregation points. So at those aggregation points, you can reach more potential customers. And um, so the in, in return, what I mentioned before, the econom economic threshold for deployment is, is a lot better here. You buy this, of course, with a stricter model, less flexibility for the wholesale carrier, because you need to have the, the a fiber carrier in between, or you need to be your own fiber carrier. Um, you have a dependency on this fiber carrier, on its technology. You need to pay the fiber carrier, obviously. And um, you have the layer two transport of the fiber carry in between as well. So debugging might be a bit might be harder if there are problems coming up. Uh, you need to debug together with a fiber carrier. But um, I think it's a better possibility uh, for smaller for smaller providers to start. 
because they can just go in one or two data centers, get a port to the fiber carrier, and automatically have access to all their subscribers via those two ports. In summary, there's not a one-size-fits-all solution here. Um, the, the, the technology mostly depends on economic parameters that you want to set with the choice of your technology. If you want to use Aon or Pon, which Pon technology you want to use. Um, economic parameters is mostly what I told you before. Uh, when, it, when does it make sense to build out an area with FTPH? How many customers does a wholesale carrier or fiber carrier need to actually build out those fibers? You also have technical um, requirements. How many fibers can we handle in a distribution point? How, how often do we need to add active equipment? And then environmental requirements coming into play. How much space is available to put street cabinets um, on the street? In, again, in more rural areas, it might be easier. You just go to the corner of the city. Maybe you can build uh, one or two stations on, on, or maybe even four stations on each side. And uh, that, that's good enough. If you're looking at larger cities like Berlin, street space is very rare. And um, if, you, if you say, hey, I'm building a, a fiber network here, then the city might say, okay, cool. Yeah, you can, you can put up your street cabinet here. But then if you have aggregation points, there's no, not enough space uh, to, to host uh, for wholesale carriers in this, usually in the street cabinet. So they put another street cabinet next to it. The next wholesale carrier puts a street cabinet next to it and so on. That basically means, yeah, you would, you would basically have a lot of street cabinets suddenly uh, bundling up in some areas of the city and uh, no one actually would al allow that. Probably. That was in real quick everything. No questions. Okay, yeah, we do. Thank you for the talk. It was quite interesting from my, my perspective. We do have uh, some questions here. Um, starting with the first why is PON asymmetric in most of the times? Uh, PON is asymmetric if you use GPON. If you go further to XGS PON, then you have um, the, the, at least the base layer is symmetric. What product uh, you put onto that? That's up to the whole, uh, up to the carrier who's building out the PON, or in the end, the wholesale carrier who's doing that. But for XGS PON, it's it's a symmetric connection. Okay. Isn't there a security risk since the combined optical signal um, at all termination points visible? Yeah, that's um, what the encryption is coming for and uh, via the control channel uh, or the encryption gets um, the, they are the OLT and the ONT talk to each other and they make out an encryption key via the control channel. And um, then all traffic which uh, goes between the OLT and the ONT is, in, is encrypted. So the, the security risk here is that someone can sniff the encrypted traffic and maybe eventually break the, the encryption. But uh, yeah, you have this everywhere on the internet, basically. Okay. Uh, what split ratios uh, do the major incumbents in uh, Germany are using? I have no idea. <laughs> you would need to Me ask neither. the major incumbents. <laughs> but <laughs> um, like <laughs> as I, about the, the split ratios that I mentioned here, uh, like 1 to 32 is probably too low for a GPON uh, that I was using in the table. Probably for GPON, I could imagine people would use 1 to 64. You can use up to uh, 1 to 128, I think, on GPON. On XGS PON, I'm not really sure if you can go a lot higher. But again, the more, the higher you go, you less, uh, you, you, the more you need to, uh, you need to aggregate because uh, the, the loss is higher, obviously. So you need to also balance it depending on the area where you want to build out and how many aggregation points you have, where you can have active equipment, things like that. Yeah. Okay, yeah. When burying cables for uh, connections of buildings, do you already account for defective single fibers and uh, through spare fibers uh, for later um, expansion? And how many? Um, yeah, obviously. <laughs> I mean, you 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 pull a fiber. The, the pulling the, the fiber itself is not not the hard part. Um, the, uh, the the price of fiber compared to the actually labor of uh, uh, pulling the fiber and doing the construction work on the street is is minimal. 
So you would pull a lot uh, more fibers into the building, probably also more than you uh, more you would need plus spare fibers. So in case at a later point another technology comes and you want to uh, use more fibers to, to to connect the customers, you don't need to pull in new fibers immediately. Um, mm. How many fibers uh, you you would use on a cable uh, as spares depends again on your economy. Uh, how much how, how what you want to do. Personally, I would uh, at least uh, um, like if I want to if I know that I'm using eight fibers in the building, I, um, I would at least pull sixteen or more in, into there. Okay. Um, how is the oversubscription ratio compared to the typical DSA cable setups uh, for end customers? I have no idea how how the oversubscription on DSL or cable networks are. Just from experience, I can imagine, uh, like I'm on a cable network right now, I can imagine they are quite high. Um, from what I'm seeing is, or what I, my, my imagination would be that they are lower on the um, pond side, even lower on, well, not even lower, but on, on the Aeon side, um, they would be probably uh, roughly the same as on the pond side, except that you're getting, uh, you have the last mile for yourself. Um, but I would imagine that if you're going with a fiber build out, the oversubscription is less and uh, the env environmental issues that you have uh, with frequencies or something or stuff like that is a lot lower as well compared to DSL or cable. Okay. Um, we have a lot more questions. So if you still have time and I got some more time here, I will go on. So if that's fine for you. Yeah. Well, I don't mind. Great. Um, do the splitters separate the signals or um, is every subscriber receiving all signals? Um, everything, every subscriber is receiving all the signals on his fiber. So if the OLT sends out um, tra uh, traffic um, towards this one port, all the, um, all the subscribers which are on the same fiber receive all the traffic. What is the maximum number of customers you can connect uh, with a single fiber when using PON? I think that's basically how much. The yeah, with, with, with GPON, I think it's yeah. With GPON, I'm fairly certain the maximum would be 128. Uh, with XGS PON, I'm not 100 percent sure if it's 128 or if they went up to 256. Why would you need uh, more handover points for wholesale carriers with AON? Um, you can still set, uh, sell bitstream access there. That you can do. That's true. But then you would need to have the um, then you would need to build the aggregation layer as the, the as the fiber carrier, and you would need to have the aggregation points um, earlier. So you have, would have more cost on the fiber networks uh, fiber carrier network side. Okay. Which light levels are expected uh, at the OTN? Can I look into the um, cable with my remaining eye? Um, let me think. Um, I think, um, I, I don't know if you can actually look into it because I'm not that much into the physics of fiber cables. I think I remember something like 20 to 23 dBs. Uh, um, total loss that you can have, but um, I, I might be wrong here. Don't quote me on that. I would neither suggest to try it anyway. Yeah, I, I wouldn't. Um, I wouldn't really try it. I would never. But yeah, uh, actually, th there was one more slide in my presentation that I got uh, that I uh, got out uh, for time issues, which is, didn't work so well. If you look at the, if I look at the time now, but uh, where I was com uh, explaining that I'm coming from the active network world, I know a little bit of passive networks. Uh, as much at least as I know, I need to know to design active networks. But if you probe me too much, at some point I will say I don't know, as you mentioned in this questioning. You know, is there any agreed standard for layer two bitstream access? Um, not really a standard. No, um, there is. Um, there, there has some, some kind of standardization going on. For example, there's a standardized um, interface with which you can order ports which are going via layer 2 um, DSA. 
um, in German, in Germany at, well, as, at least, this a standard is called SPRI, uh, S-PRI, um, which is uh, basically an interface description describing the process of ordering a port, getting acknowledgement, getting to, um, so the whole SEC area gets to know when field service comes out, things like that are formalized. Um, the actual interconnection between the, the fiber carrier and the wholesale carrier is up to contract negotiations between the two. Usually, of course, if you're a larger wholesale carrier, you would ask for the same service that you already receive because you want to integrate it into your network. Okay. Um, there's, uh, yeah, why not, why not using uh, CWDM or uh, DWDM uh, hardware? Mostly because it's a lot more expensive than a PON hardware would be. There is um, an XG, XG PON variant which uses um, WDM instead of uh, the, the, the time division multiple access that we've seen here. Uh, but this hasn't progressed much and it, it's mostly dying out right by now because the other variant uh, with the time division uh, TDMA is a lot cheaper to produce um, um, and to operate than if you would uh, use WDM on, on the access medium. Okay, and now the last two questions. Is there a possibility to share the medium with other providers? Or no, not well, very not, not, not the medium itself. Um, if, you are, if you are on a fiber, the one fiber needs to be connected to the same OLT on the, on the, on the PON. Because um, as I mentioned, the, the, the OLT will communicate with the ONTs they will form a control channel and the ONT also needs to be accepted on the OLT. So in order to, for the communication to happen, you need to have full control over this one fiber. What you could potentially do is give out fiber to different wholesale carriers, which are already um, routed via splitters. Then they can run their own PON hardware on, 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 the, on this fiber. But that means that on this one fiber, every subscriber needs to be a customer of the wholesale carrier where the fiber is going to. Okay. And the last one is, is uh, NGPON2, the IEEE standard, not really used in Europe? Um, this, uh, this is a bit complicated, or I haven't looked that much into the different standards because there are different names for, those, for the XG or NGPON standards. I think that XGS PON is part of the NG PON2 standard uh, or like a subpart of it, but um, I don't actually know the relationship between the, all, all the standards because it, it, I was just looking into it and it was super confusing. Like there is, for example, like also an XG PON standard without the S, so it's not symmetric. Um, I, you get the same downstream for like roughly 10 gigabits per second, but the upstream then is just 2.4 uh, or 2.5 or something like that, um, which is then also part of some X, uh, some NGPON standard, maybe even NGPON2. So it, it's uh, basically, the, there are a lot of standards in this field. I was just concentrating on the two, which are mostly uh, in use as far as I know. Okay, thank you very much, Markus. And um, so far we yeah, are thank you. through most of the questions and have a great rest of the day.